scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 27, verses 39 through 44. I'll be reading out the New King James. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with the beach, onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left them in the sea, meanwhile loosing the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow struck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship, and so it was that they all escaped safely to land.
In the lesson text here, people were rescued on the broken pieces of the ship. Now think about a, you know, a, 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 a plank, a board from a boat, wood that floats, and people just grabbing a hold of it. They're offshore, the waves and the wind are beating on them, and all you can do is grab something and hang on. Grabbing a piece of a ship like a surfboard or something. Most, most, maybe all, several, many at least would have died if not for broken pieces of a ship. In the 28th chapter of the book of Acts, we read about all kinds of good things that happened on this island named Malta. Uh, Paul got snake bit and survived it. The governor, of the, 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 the head person on the island, the, the patriarch of the island, uh, saw his father miraculously healed by Paul. People from the island just kept bringing people to Paul and he healed them all, it says, because of the shipwreck. Is it such a stretch then to compare a shipwreck to our life? Because I described an ideal life there a while ago and you know, we just don't live that life. Uh, a life like that would make us want to cling to this world. And life just not like that. The Apostle Paul wrote at least 13 epistles of the 26 in the New Testament. Maybe more than half. He was shipwrecked according to 2 Corinthians 11.25 three times. You know, God set this earth in motion. He set this world into motion. And there's tsunamis, there's tornadoes, there's earthquakes. There's shipwrecks, rainstorms, droughts. God just put all this into motion. One of the times that Paul was shipwrecked here, he floated around, he said, for a night and a day. A night and a day was I in the deep. 24 hours, he was floating in the ocean. How terrified could a person, would a person be floating around in the Mediterranean Sea? The water was warm. And there he was floating around. It got daylight. And he was floating around. It got nighttime. He was floating around. And after he completed this narrative in 1 Corinthians 11 about all that he suffered for his service to Christ, he concludes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, he says, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I think. Uh, uh, Rainier Day, one preached my sermon last week. Uh, I'm content with hardships. I'm content with calamities. Paul said, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. That's the craziest thing. Now. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know, Luke talked about, uh, Luke talked about a piece of metal that, that goes into the fire that's weak Wednesday night. And then it becomes strong because something happens to it. When I am weak, I'm strong. How can a weak, <laughs> broken person be strong? Look back at the famous people of the Old Testament, Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith. Uh, Hebrews 11, 32. What more shall I say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Hebrews 11, 33. Who through faith? Conquer kingdoms, enforce justice, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword. Were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Now think about uh, I think about Gideon, the first one that's mentioned here, taking three hundred men and defeating an army of a hundred over a hundred thousand. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. The plain fact is, and I could probably stop right here with this statement, if God allows or causes or whatever the ship of our lives to be broken up, he will provide a way to shore. <coughs> they were made strong by the one who takes what's broken and uses it to his glory and honor. Let's look at broken things that glorify God. Go to the book of Mark with me. 
chapter 14. I'm going to read the first nine verses of that. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Mark 14, 1 through 9. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that, Judas? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing for me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. He's talking about in physical form. She has done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I guess I just did that. Just fulfilled that prophecy. Again, one of the <coughs> multitude of times. She broke a flask that had a long neck, and it had a wax seal. And when the seal was broken, then Ara could get in and cause this to spoil, so it had to be used. <coughs> Worth about $40 to $55, depending on the commentary you read and, you know, today's values of money. A small fortune to this woman when they made a couple of pennies a day as a laborer, $40 to $55, could be years paid. Maybe this is something she inherited or something that she was saving for her own burial, for her father's burial or a dear service for her. When she broke the box, something was done there that couldn't be undone. It couldn't be, un it couldn't be sealed back. It couldn't be undone. She had committed herself to giving to Jesus all that she could give to him. She had done what she could. What an epitaph for a tombstone. He has done what he could. She has done what she could. So what was really broken in this historical account of this woman anointing Jesus, he said for his burial, what was broken here, what was in disrepair, what was, what was wrong, was the attitude and conscience of the people in verse 4. Mm -hmm. Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. That verse concludes with them scolding her. Other translations said they murmured against her. They said cruel things to the woman. They told the woman what a bad thing she had done. Anointing the Son of God, God in human form, scolding her for the bad things she'd done. For literally worshiping with all that she had the Son of God by breaking something. Here's the entire, here's the irony of this whole historical account. John 12, 4 tells us exactly who it was, and I said it a minute ago. But Judas. <laughs> and he told us why. Uh, John doesn't pull any punches with Judas. Chapter 12 and verse 6 of John says he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. One of the apostles, one of the men that Jesus got down and washed the feet of. Whole other lesson there. The very next verse in Mark's account, verse Mark 14, verse 10, where I left off my reading a minute ago, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to it. The very next verse in Mark, Judas went to the chief priest to betray Jesus. Further irony, the price of the oil, the cost of the oil. The value of the oil worth about $40 to $55. What they paid Judas to betray Jesus was worth about half that. About half that. That's, that's ironic to me, but there's a lesson in that. He sold himself out. He sold his soul, literally, 
for half of what he was complaining about a woman worshiping Jesus with. The broken flesh brought glory to God. The Son of God on earth, that flesh that was broken, glorified Jesus on earth. And Judas, Judas' broken soul, Judas' broken attitude, <coughs> Judas' broken conscience. You know, the fact of the matter is, there's some things that are just broken. They're just broken. And Judas was. And according to history, scriptural history, Judas was never fixed. You know, when Jesus, Judas betrayed Jesus, he went to the cross, he died, and when his body and soul separated, the veil of the temple was torn completely in two. The veil of the temple itself was broken. The veil separated the holy place from the most holy place in Moses' tabernacle and in the temple for these thousand years or so. <clears throat> Hebrews 9, that I would not take time to read this morning, but if you go to Hebrews 9, you, you read a, an account of an expl explanation, description of all this. Only the high priest could go behind that veil to enter into the presence of God. God sits in the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And it says that uh, in Hebrews 9 that these sacrifices that the priests offer cannot perfect the conscience. And immediately it seems, according to what we can read, immediately upon the death of Jesus, that thing that separated man from God that place where they went and did the best that they could but they could not perfect the conscience was ripped right down the middle miraculously by the hand of God broken in half split wide open destroyed now immediately after that Jew and Gentile <laughs> Levi Marbonian Road Creeker Could approach the presence of God Almighty Himself without needing someone to make a sacrifice of an animal that can't perfect the conscience. Hebrews 10, beginning with verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In Christ, the barrier between God and mankind was forever broken. And thank God that it was. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. These people in Ephesus, these Gentiles, these people who had no hope according to the law of Moses, only had a moral code. You who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus broke something down, and thank God that he broke that wall down because here we are right now. There we were. Feasting with him in his presence. Without having to go through another. Jesus Christ himself interceding for us. The ultimate in broken was mentioned here in these verses. Broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22. All three are the historical accounts of Jesus instituting his remembrance supper. In all three accounts, Jesus broke the bread. And he told the apostle, this is my body. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 said, this is, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Not the bones of his body, according to prophecy fulfilled, his body ripped and torn to shreds. 
do this in remembrance of me. In those references from Ephesians, opportunity for all mankind to come to Jesus because that veil was torn. Time doesn't permit me to recount all the terrible things that were done to the body that God had prepared for his son on this earth. From the time Judas betrayed him, which had to be broken his heart, to the time when he proclaimed those three words, it is finished. The time when Satan danced with joy because what Satan heard was it's over. But what we understand is it's complete. I've completed my task. Suffice it to say that Jesus suffered by the whole human being could ever suffer. People have suffered physically through torture. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's terrible the things that people have done to one another in history. But no human being who was ever tortured, who was ever put to death in a terrible, slow way, carried the knowledge of every wrongdoing that everyone on earth would ever commit, knowing how unworthy we are of that cross with him. The physical suffering was extreme. What he carried to the cross was beyond my ability to imagine. First Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. Every sin of everyone who ever lived is living and may live and in the future was carried by Jesus to the cross. Therefore no man on earth ever suffered like him. No man was ever broken like Jesus was broken. He was broken so we could be fixed. Jesus was betrayed by two of his apostles. Peter denied him. Judas sold him out. Judas died broken. Peter, by the blood of Jesus Christ, was fixed, put back together. Only through Jesus Christ can that happen. Only in Jesus Christ can that happen. 2 Corinthians 3.14 and Jude 1.4 use this, use this particular phrase concerning ungodly people, people who are broken, deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 tells us there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so much thing, so much information about how God has taken what's been broken and used it to His glory. Broken pieces of a ship, no problem, float to shore. Broken flesh, no problem, anoint Jesus for His burial. Don't be like the men that the Apostle Paul told Timothy about Hymenaeus and Alexander. You know what he said about them? Their faith had suffered shipwreck. This implies that these men didn't reach for the broken pieces of the ship. Their faith was shipwrecked, period. It was broken. The ESV says fell into ruins. Their faith had fallen into ruins. Thank God, though, in 1 Corinthians 1.25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. 
You know what that verse says? God takes things that we consider to be broken and uses them to His glory and to His purpose. St. Corinthians 12, 10, Paul said, For when I am weak, then I am strong. I stand here a very broken and flawed person. And I have reached so many times for that piece of broken wood. Every time, every single time, it took me to show Pray to God that I never stop reaching for that. Always reach for what God has put in front of us to make us to show His Son who was horribly broken, can fix the worst thing that can happen to us. Our broken souls. One sin, one sin breaks a soul beyond repair except for the blood of Jesus Christ. One sin. So the broken piece of the ship that can take you to shore may be the words that I have read from the Word of God today, the words that I have spoken to encourage you in obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, these words will bring you to shore. Everything here is ready. There is no excuse to not reach for that broken piece of the ship and go to shore. Water, here's water. What hinders you? If you're my brother or sister in Christ and you've fallen away, Paul said, Hymenaeus and Alexander's faith had suffered shipwreck. Was it over for them? It wasn't over for Peter when he was broken. When he shed tears of remorse for denying the Lord. It may be that you're here this morning and you've denied the Lord. <coughs> that what's been broken is prepared for eternal soul. Let's stand now and sing the invitation song. And if you're subject to the invitation, please make your way to the front. Who will follow Jesus standing in the right? Holy of his Oh. Uh -huh.